welcome to this New Year edition of what is a new uh, adventure in our podcast series, namely a joint podcast uh, between myself and Ian Wilkinson of Cotswold Seeds and FarmEd fame. Um, I'll just say a couple of sentences, Ian, and perhaps you could do your intro. So uh, we are here in, interestingly enough, the prayer room of Oxford Town Hall on the 6th of January. And right outside the door of this room are 1,800 people celebrating the Oxford, the Real Oxford Farming Conference, the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which is, has become the event of the food and farming year for those of us interested in sustainability. Uh, so it's rather appropriate that we're having this conversation here. And I suspect, Ian, over to you, that both of us have got lots of memories of this place. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. I, it, it is really bizarre, isn't it, to be sat in this very quiet room, knowing that around us there's all these amazing people, you know, frenetically you know, meeting up and talking to each other. And I, I remember um, back 12 years or whenever this, con- this particular conference 15 started. 15 years. 15 years, is, is it? Goodness me, how time goes. Well, but, I, you know, having come from the old farming conference that of, of old, uh, which is the, uh, the, or the alternative conference, uh, and, and been in both, you know, this is, has a very different, lively feel uh, compared to the rather more conservative feel of the, of the, um, the other conference. And, and I've really enjoyed both aspects of it, and I've witnessed amazing things over the years. But I think that what's astonished me more than anything is the growth of this. And it's like Groundswell and all these other amazing events that have taken place in the last few years. That this, this recognition, I suppose, that things are changing, farmer-driven, grower-driven... Uh, food driven, you know, all those things that we, we love to, to, to see in action is all here in Oxford. And I'm in Oxfordshire, so, you know, with, um, with my seat hat on and also with, my, uh, with, with our new uh, thing, uh, you know, Farm Ed, which is, uh, which is in Oxfordshire. And it just feels like, I'm, I just feel so privileged to be in this sort of hotspot of activity. Isn't it great? It's brilliant. And so the format that we sort of plotted before we started this discussion was that you might interview me uh, for your podcast, uh, and then I might interview you, and then we could launch it together. What do you think? Well, I think it's a great idea, and it's really bizarre, because we um, I mean, literally stumbled over each other only yesterday, I know, to, saying, well, and we almost have the same words, don't we? Let's do a podcast. And I was thinking I, I'd, you know, get you on the Farm Ed podcast, and you obviously had some... So, let, yeah, let's share it. Why not? Um, so... I think, Patrick, um, I'd love to know, I mean, I remember when we first met back in Bristol a long time ago, but could you just set the scene of, of those days and then let's get up to speed very quickly as to what you've done, because I know you've done so many things, but keep it short. All right, try. We've, we've only got a bit of time here. <laughs> well, uh, Jonathan Dimbleby um, uh, interviewed his brother, Nicholas, for a very moving series on uh, Radio 4 called On the Bright Side, uh, because his, his brother has motor neuron disease and he described himself as chief interrupter in the interview because he was inter- interrupting his brother. So you must interrupt me if I go on too long. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Uh, so, uh, yes, we met in Colston Street. And for the listeners, this is, you know, I think history is important. Mm. So uh, I, I indulge me for a second. In November 1985, the Soil Association moved from its headquarters in Hawley uh, Stoke, near Stowe Market in Suffolk, where, which is where, of course, Lady Eve set up the Soil Association, to Colson Street. And the story behind that move was, like so many things, uh, quite accidental. There was a person who was known to a great friend of mine, Peter Seger, who had a bookshop called the Green Leaf Bookshop in Colson Street. And she said, oh, I've got some rooms above it. I remember. You, you were literally above the shop. Yes. I remember going, yes. yes. And, so we, and then it turned into a bike shop and so on and so on. But basically... We were there between November 1985 and 1997. So that was a 12-year period of extraordinary expansion. When it started, there were five people in the office, and then I think when we moved to Victoria Street, which is quite near where the Soil Association is today, there were 150 or something like Mm. that. And it was an amazing time because it was very much growers and farmers because it was British Organic Farmers and the Organic Growers Association cohabiting with the Soil Association. Then we... Late, later merged yeah, and we so. had some fabulous meetings there yeah. and it was quite radical we always used to go to the pub with Mary Langman who was Lady Eve's great friend and fellow traveller 
And I remember she used to smoke roll-ups and drink red wine with all of us as we did at those times. <laughs> I, I remember that very clearly. I, I remember the Royal Show, and again, for the purpose of history, it does, which doesn't run anymore, but I remember sharing a tent with the Sword Association uh, back in the day. And I think um, one of the things I remember about it was the cider at the end of the Royal Show and very hot days <laughs> of great fun. And the fun element was very much part of the uh, of, of the whole scene, I think, in those times, wasn't it? About, it was exciting and, um, you know, there was, a, there was obviously the start of a very big transition, which we now think about as, I guess, organic, regenerative, you know, eco agroecological thinking, but very much from those early days. I was introduced, actually, by Robin Hill to you uh, in Colston Street. Um, what year? Well, it must have been the middle eighties because yeah. um, we drove down from the Cotswolds, and um, and I really wasn't sure what to make of it, having come from a fairly conventional agricultural background. You know, I was challenged by it, frankly, and uh, organic farming. Well, you know, that that's that that was a, to me something that wasn't in my training. So I was really challenged, and uh, you know, but I thank you for doing that because obviously it opened my mind to other uh, options. Well, it's funny you should mention it again. This is a bit of history, but you know why not? Uh, we, meaning the Soil Association, had a stand at the Royal Show in 1983. That was the first time we were there, when it was at Stoneleigh back in the yeah, day. That's it. And uh, we, we, we hitched a ride on the back of Crank's stand, and they served sandwiches, because I used to deliver carrots to Crank's back then. Yeah. And I've got a picture, then the Royal Show presence grew like Topsy, and I remember a particular year, I was looking at a photograph just the other day, of the Royal Show stand, it might have been the year you mentioned, and in the background, Cotswold Seeds. Yeah, well, you know what happened? Do you know what happened? No. Prince Charles came, and he was introduced to us by, I forget the name of the lady at the time, but anyway, he was introduced to, uh, I was a junior, I was young, uh, you know, in my very early years at Cotswold Seeds, with Robin Hill on the stand. Robin was very smart. And Prince Charles was introduced to Robin, and in a very short period of time, was asked about organic seed and was there was there any because a regulation was coming and we needed to be aware of it well there wasn't any organic seed in the sector that we worked in which was of course uh, herbage seed forage crops and all the fertility building plants but it really you know it really shocked us because we were dealing with a lot of farmers who were certified and you know increasingly we were thinking well how are we going to supply seed that doesn't exist at the moment and we could see this as being a barrier to change actually but yeah, that was one of my early recollections. And then you and I discussed it in your offices, I remember, over the years, because I was quite adamant that we couldn't do it. Yes. And some of it we can't do, actually. Well, I remember another thing, which is, I forgot the guy's name, but the chief scientist, literally the UK chief scientist, he was a New Zealander, Robert somebody. Anyway, he referred to the Soil Association as Ayatollahs. <laughs> <laughs> and you might have agreed with him because we were probably did we were setting, it, uh, on this regulation. Yes, yes. So he said you are setting standards which are so high and unreachable that it's making it very difficult for normal farmers to comply. And I think I, at that stage in my development, I was saying, look, we've got to have organic seeds, and you know, if you can't sell organic seeds, you're part of the problem. And I have to say, I think I've changed my position on that because it made it more and more difficult. Uh, for farmers to get the right seeds and make a go of things. Well, this is interesting because what happened was, um, because there wasn't much choice, it created a monopoly and the price of seed went through the roof. And because the regulation was coming in where you had to use a good proportion of your seeds as organic, it meant you had, as a grower, farmer, you had to buy whatever was on the market. Well, of course, the prices went up, it was supply and demand. And uh, the worst thing was choice, lack of choice. So even though we were... In the early stages of multiplication of seed lots, we there was no choice of seed. So we actually had restricted this, because we have a massive range of diverse uh, plants and varieties of those plants, but we couldn't use them because there was no organic seed. So it really was, it felt very unfair on the grower. And I think that's where my beef was really. Um, well, let's say my bad, as they say these days. <laughs> but interestingly, literally as we speak in the Oxford Town Hall, scene of many great gatherings, many of which I've got great memories of. Lord Deben, a.k.a. John Gummer, is currently speaking. I think he's actually virtual, not physical. But he was the person who launched the um, United Kingdom Register of Organic Food Standards in 1987, mm. which then 
represented effectively the government for the very first time getting involved with uh, certifying and overseeing the certification of organic products and then that led to the discussion about seeds yes we're we're still having which is we are still having aren't we that's right and so i mean just obviously so much we could talk about but it's it's moving to me that we go back that far because then we've been part of the siren sester conferences and you know talking of oxford the Siren Sester Conference, the first of which was in 1980, organised by Peter Seger, was an attempt to challenge the orthodoxy of the Oxford Farming Conference. And for many years, it was the alternative Oxford Conference, except it wasn't in Oxford. And then Colin Tudge and Graham Harvey, or Graham Harvey and Colin Tudge actually came up with this idea. Well, because by that time, this, we're now talking, I think, 2006 or something like that, maybe 2007. It might have been even later than that, but anyway, that sort of time, the organic national conference was slightly losing its way. It was becoming less of a sort of gathering, central gathering point. So they had the idea of having a spoiler conference, which was not the Oxford Farming Conference. And of course, now, I was just there yesterday, it's eclipsed the conventional farming conference completely with. 1,800 people physically present and another 1,500 online. So well, what an extraordinary it, development. It is extraordinary, but when you're looking for... I mean, farming is always evolving, isn't it? And it's always going to, and everybody in it is changing. And uh, you, know, maybe, you maybe are on different ends of that bell curve, but it's always going to evolve. And I think for me, what's important is there's a forum, a place where these conversations and ideas can be explored safely, where people can express their views and opinions and find common solutions. And I think that's what I'm experiencing in, in this space at the moment is you know, the regenerative farming and everyone's sort of jumping on that bandwagon, if you like. It just seems to me that you need to have people challenging it from a scientific point of view, from a, a practical perspective, from a regulatory perspective, and, and everyone comes together uh, in, these, in, these, in these forums. And I mean, it's one of the reasons we started Farm Ed um, was to create a place for those conversations to happen. Anyway, that's... Uh, we'll perhaps discuss that in a bit more detail. But I'm really pleased that this has become popular. And I wonder in another 10 years, what's next? You know, what's the next evolution, I wonder? I think it's interesting you say that because there are quite a number of people who've come here this year for the first time and who used to be at the Siren Sister conferences. And one of them actually said to me last night, it was a she, she said, I'm feeling slightly strange because I felt we created this atmosphere back in the Siren Sister days where many of these sort of emotions and inspirational atmosphere were present. And then there was a great gap because she hadn't been to any of these conferences and she's come here and she's always slightly overwhelmed because she feels in some ways, hang on a minute, there's a kind of feeling that no one here who's here today even knew about that chapter of the history, which is very often the case, isn't it? Because yes, it's incredible always. how yes. quickly yes. history yes. gets overlaid with the layer of leaves, as it were, and, you know, people who were there at that time die or whatever they do, you know, yeah. and, and the memory's gone. And it was um, Mary Langman, Lady E. Balfour's great friend, who said to me, it's important to remember your history. So I think we are honouring the history of these events. But I also think it's reassuring what you just said, that it's important to accept that things change, that things evolve. And, you know, you could be critical about this conference. You could say it's anarchic. And if you go to sessions, it's a bit of a lottery. Some of them are brilliant, some of them a bit of a dog. But that's how it is, isn't it? You've been and to mine <laughs> sessions. <laughs> no, I, I regret I, I haven't been to them, but only because I was, you know, forced to do something else. <laughs> so, Patrick, when we, after we had those early days, then, back to, back to those earlier. So what did you, I mean, you, you know, here we are now talking about regenerative farming. I mean, you've moved on in your thinking and ideas, and uh, I know, and, I mean... What, what, where, how, do you, how do you come to sort of be in this current evolution of, of, of you and the Sustainable Food uh, Trust and so on? Uh, tell, tell me a bit about that. Well, um, I left the Soil Association in 2010. And as these transitions always are, it was complicated. But let's just distill it into a simple story. Uh, we can click on it to go into more detail if we want to. Um, during the time I was heading the Soil Association, 15 years, uh, and before that actually, uh, I was very much involved with the development of organic standards internationally and nationally. And as a result, I uh, was fortunate enough to meet lots of people all over the world who were doing parallel work. And there was a moment where I thought, 
uh, it would be good to capitalise on this incredible network and to step out onto a slightly different stage, which was more inclusive, because back to the point about the Soil Association being Ayatollahs and I was, of course, part of that, um, it became clear to me that unless the whole of agriculture changes and our food systems, and, and the transition is literally global and comprehensive, we're not going to have a livable planet for our children and those that follow us. So I felt that some of the work that we've been doing rightly, in my opinion, at the Soil Association, this is not a criticism of the Soil Association, it's just a commentary on how things have gone, was tending to create a movement which was separate from mainstream agriculture, and some conventional farmers felt a little bit attacked by it, and that was probably my fault. Um, and I felt we had to move something more inclusive to make sure that everybody could feel that they were part of the transition. So in a way, right in the DNA of the Sustainable Food Trust, which was formed in 2011, 2012, we actually got charitable status, was accelerating the transition to more sustainable, choose your word, regenerative, organic, yeah. biodynamic food systems. We can get into terminologies perhaps in a yeah. moment. Um, and to act as a catalyst, because obviously we're only a small organisation, we don't want to get big. We definitely don't want to do certification, although we're involved with the architecture of that stuff, and we should talk about that as well. Um, ten years on, I'm feeling fantastic about it, because it's been my great privilege to meet loads of interesting people who are not directly involved with organic farming, but are very interested in the principles and practices which move in that direction. So you've gone down, uh, I would say, further down the food road. I mean, I fully appreciate that organic farming is going to produce food. But in this case, would you, would you describe the Sustainable Food Trust as being more focused on the food, uh, further down to the eater, if you like, than you were before at the Soil Association? No, I don't think I would, actually. Um, because, you know, if you think about what the Soil Association has done and is doing, we got involved with processing standards and labelling. And of course, um, that's a very important, confusing and contentious debate right now it's because of you know, what the public doesn't know what to eat and what sort of farming system should be behind it, which possibly touch on that as well. But basically, I think that our, our, we, we are rooted in farming practice. And I think, so if I was to say what I feel is the USP of the Sustainable Food Trust, I'd say it was founded by a farmer, me, mm. and I care more than anything else about connecting, creating a bridge between f farming philosophy and practice and principles and a food system which is built on that foundation. And I think the great risk at the moment is with food labelling and also with conventional agriculture, which is slightly hoping that we won't have to change too much to be truly regen or whatever, that we need to co connect a linkage where people can buy the food with a sustainable, a truly sustainable story behind it, but in a more inclusive way. Yeah, I, I think that's for a highly, you know, it, and that goal is absolutely essential. I think we've become so disconnected from our food system that the very few people that grow food for the majority of people, you know, I mean, those, the, the people that eat food are lacking that information. I mean, it's a big challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's a huge challenge. And so in this era that we're now in with regenerative farming, uh, for, for example, um, which is uncertified, and um, often people pick one thing. So, for example, and, 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 and no, nothing in one particular order, you know, water quality or, or nature recovery or uh, carbon sequestration. I mean, you've been, I would say, certainly pioneering, developing, a, a, you know, a... And a, a, a very wide-ranging way of uh, uh, all-encompassing way of measuring and looking at outcomes, which I think is really clever and but incredibly complicated. Well, I'll, I'll try and tell a simple story of how we got to that. Uh, shortly after we formed the Sustainable Food Trust um, in actually 2011, uh, the then Prince Charles was going to America. Uh, and it was agreed that he would give a talk called The Future of Food at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And there's a fascinating story about the preparation for that conference, which brought together people from all over America. And his speech was actually published in a little booklet called The Prince's Speech on the Future of Food, which is a lovely little mm -hmm. thing. I'm not sure if it's even in print now. But anyway, one of the key passages in The Prince's Speech was about externalities, as economists call them. In other words, he said there were perverse subsidies 
and the absence of the application of the polluter pays principle, which in combination made sustainable farming uh, more expensive for consumers and less profitable for farmers. And he said something should be done. And that focus, which he did out of his own intuition, really, on the economic perverse incentives which skewed the economics of farming and the cost of food, became, I became very, very interested in that. And I thought, hang on a minute, what's going on here? So we organised a conference in December 2013 in London, and actually another one before that in Kentucky, called uh, True Cost Accounting. Mm. And that was a term coined actually by one of our board members, Christy Brown, who uh, lives in Louisville, Kentucky, and is a great fan of now King Charles. And she said, just call it something simple, true cost accounting. That's what, you know, that's that's what it, it says on the tin. And now mm. that's, that's gone into the international language now, which is so mm. interesting. Mm. So we thought, OK, we need to find out the extent of these distorted economics, which are making good food appear expensive and awful food appear cheap. And of course, that's a combination of looking at the so-called negative externalities, which is, you know, the polluter doesn't pay for water cleanup or National Health Service treatment bills or climate change or biodiversity loss, trying to monetize those. And we got involved with an initiative called TEEB Agri-Food, terrible, unpronounceable acronym, mm -hmm. which was headed up by a man called Pavan Sukhdev, an Indian. And they've just actually done a study launched here at this conference on the smallholder farmers of the state of Andhra Pradesh in India, where they've worked out the social, the positive social externalities which are being delivered by their, their organic smallholder scheme, which aren't properly costed. So we quite quickly realised, because Richard Young, mm. who is very we much in my very memory, much. Yes. so he put together a report called The Hidden Costs of UK Food, which we published in 2017, which the headline of which was, if you buy a, a pound's worth of supermarket food in a retailer today, that's not the true cost, the true price of the food. You can double it. And that was his headline. And he only did the known knowns, being very cautious and very assiduous. Richard said, well, I'm not going to speculate about whether cancer's linked or anything like that. These are just absolutely rock-solid, scientifically proven negative externalities which are not factored into the price. So that figure, a pound spent, should cost two pounds if you factor in those costs. It's now expanded and the most recent report published by Rockefeller suggests it's not one pound or two pounds, it's three pounds. Yeah. So we're only wow. paying a third of the true cost of our food when we buy it in supermarkets. Mm. And that's why the price of organic food has appeared so high because we're operating against an economic headwind where the polluter doesn't pay and the positive externalities are not we don't benefit from those. So that led to a conclusion because there were lots of other reports of this kind that came out and all of them were using different metrics. So somebody said this morning that there are 60 different carbon tools and all of them are giving different results. Oh, gosh, so yes. we thought yeah. in the Sustainable Food Trust we need to globally harmonise, a bit like economic accounting protocols, the way in which we measure land use sustainability. And that was the origin of the Global Farm Metric, which started in 2015, I think. So we're seven or eight years in, um, no, nine years, if, if I'm right. Um, and we've now got a, a, a global coalition of organisations, NGOs, big companies, banks, all of whom agree that we need to harmonise. And I do actually think it's some, something that the UK can lead with. We'll see what happens, because, of course, in these situations, it's a bit like the early organic standards, and there are absolute parallels, because we were leaders in the UK, interestingly enough, in, in defining organic back yep. in the mm. 80s, and then gradually it became global. Well, we need the same process to go on in measuring land use sustainability impacts. So we are not in necessarily the DNA of it, but we're definitely... We, we, we're, we're, in, we're in the vanguard of helping to harmonise this new system. Uh, which is very exciting. It is, and, it, and it's absolutely necessary. And I'm sure that you'll look back and say, well, you know, we might, if we'd have only done it this way or that way, it would have been better. But, it, but even so, you know, you're, you're, as far as I know, one of the very few organisations that's actually been able to pull it all together. And I think for those of us that are, you know, 
perhaps more practitioner, I'm more practical and um, pragmatic. And, and I feel that I need to be able to explain to people, you know, what, we, what we're doing, why we're doing things the way we do it, and the effect we're having and the outcomes we're getting. And I'm less concerned about the detail of the regulations, and I'm much more concerned about the actual outcomes. And I think that's where I feel. So for all of us, you know, in, in whatever we are in the primary or post-primary production of food, we need to know where we are. Well, of course, I strongly agree with that. And it strikes me that this might be a moment to turn the tables oh. and to um, suggest that I could ask you some stuff because um, I think what you've just said about, first of all, measuring, then maybe monetizing and finding a way to attribute the costs in an honest way, and then developing a labeling scheme which is based on that, which hopefully can include the organic system because we don't want to abandon all the decades of good work uh, that we've participated in to develop the organic system. And I would say probably more than 50% of the farmers here at the Oxford Real Farming Conference are probably organically certified or farming organically and uncertified. So that's mm. a huge achievement. But we now need, I think, to come to a moment where we say, right, well, we built this alternative movement, but actually now we need to step back and allow this emergent future uh, to the work we've done to be an influence on its development rather than trying to claim new territory. There's a sort of ego thing, isn't there? Involved? Yeah, we, we just need parking out, doesn't it? I mean, I feel really strongly that, I mean, I, I come from a commercial background, as you know, and I, you know, I mean, in terms of, you know, protecting my space and you know, the marketplace, I mean, I've, I've been through all that, and I, but I feel really strongly that, you know, right now, you know, the, the, the world that we operate in is very different, and I feel like there's a lot more. Uh, maybe it's the age I am. I don't know. I'm 60 now. I don't. I don't know whether it's just comes. Oh, well, you're really but, young. You know, uh -huh. well, thank you. <laughs> uh, but I. But I think that the um, that the, my feelings are quite different, and um, I feel that uh, actually, you know, sharing common problems and looking for solutions going forward in the future is, you know, working more collaboratively, if you like, is is going to be a way forward. There still is the need to make money and to be competitive. Of course there is, but I also think that we need to work collectively together. And, you know, river valleys with farming clusters are really lovely examples of it, uh, for, you know, as, as just as one of our local Oxfordshire examples. But there's loads of things like that, aren't there, where we need to think differently. Well, there are, and I'd like to just ask you to tell your story a little bit, because I don't actually know it. I, I know you started Cotswold Seeds, but just trace that story, because it's, well, it's a sort of, as we've already established... We had parallel tracks. Yeah, we did. Well, I actually didn't start Cotswold Seeds. I joined it after it had been going for 10 years. And, oh. and Robin Hill... Uh, oh, it was Robin who formed it. Who, okay. who started Cotswold Seeds. Must honour the past. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, abs and, and Robin, um, in 1974, set up a seed company here in the Cotswolds, uh, in Chipping Norton, and um, decided to sell uh, all sorts of seeds, uh, including grass seeds. And um, Cotswold Seeds grew over the years uh, very gradually, like they, those businesses did in those days. And I joined 10 years in, in uh, the early, well, 1980, early, 19, I think, 83, I was, or 84, I was there first. What did you do before that? So I was at Agricultural College. I wanted to be a farmer. I'd worked on a mixed farm near Reading in Berkshire. Loved it every minute of it. 300 acres, rented farm. Uh, the old man employed 12 of us. And we were, we had all sorts of chickens and cows, and you know we had every agricultural. Well, it was it was a really mixed traditional farm, but was using mechanisation. Uh, we were using a lot of fertilisers, herbicides, uh, intensive chickens, uh, ex extensive pigs, indoor pigs as well, different breeds, yeah. and we were really. You know, cutting edge in terms of the agricultural intensification. So we were, I, mean, I guess I saw the tail end of the, that, those early days of the Green Revolution. But what I was seeing was um, increased productivity. I mean, back to the day when I started, two ton of wheat an acre would be pretty good. Now it would be three to four tons, easy peasy. And the previous people before me and the, the generation before me would have been one ton. So we've gone from, you know, if you think about this, in 70 or 80 years, we've gone from one ton an acre of wheat to two tons an acre of wheat, and now three to four tons. But we've plateaued, haven't we? But I remember those days, those pioneering days of being taken to demonstration farms, being shown these massive yield increases we could get with synthetic products. And I was trained to do that. I thought that was the norm. I had a few years at a pesticide company, um, Fisons and Boots, up in Nottingham, um, as, as I left college, which was really interesting, a very big corporation now, but at the time was growing rapidly with a few thousand of us employed. 
research and development, and I thought that was absolutely the way forward. I haven't read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, or uh, and I poo-pooed anyone that um, you know. Looked, wow. Yeah, well, you say wow for me. I'd say, wow, well, you'd read what? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I've read it uh, more recently, and I'm, and I'm sort of, I feel, but there were people that were asking me questions at the time, but I was absolutely... I wasn't really wowing at the fact you hadn't read it. I was more wowing at the fact that I hadn't realised that when you, when we met back in the Colson Street days in the 80s, you were coming from a very different place. Yeah, I was, but I mean, I, you know, I, I was travelling all around the UK and Europe and, and seeing the sort of, the green revolution in full, full flow. And, um, you know, we were really pushing boundaries on how much more food we could produce and how we could do it economically. Um, and that was it. There was no mention in those days of environmental uh, emissions. There was no mention of uh, ecological collapse. These were not any, just not on the radar screen. And I feel, and along with tens of thousands of farmers like me, you know, that's the world we have come from and in many respects are still in in our mindsets so for me I've sort of been through this transition over the years and do you know what triggered it actually was um, I was coming across farmers in my when I had my seed hat on so and this was buying, when you were with Cotswold so I, I went yeah I had a I, I had a summer experience of Cotswold seeds as a, as, a, as a you know as I was leaving agricultural college okay so weeks, that's planted seed part exactly, part. Yeah. exactly yeah. yeah and then I went off and worked for Fison's and Boots in the in the in an agrochemical uh, business and um, and I I travelled around you know sugar beet and potatoes and wheat all seed rape all those big arable crops and grasslands of course remember the, you know two thirds of the UK's grass big area and um, I learned loads about that that method of farming and then when I went to the seed business which was for me grass seeds I realised that farmers were doing very different things depending on where they were and what farming systems they had. And I was meeting and talking to farmers every day on the telephone about um, their farming systems. And I realised that there wasn't one system that fitted all. It wasn't like a, a monoculture of wheat where there was a blueprint that you pretty much followed. With the grasslands, it was a, there was the, you know, these, the context was everything. And it was all about understanding you know, the, 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 the traditions, the history, the, the, the people on the farm, the soil types, the, you know, the aspects of the farm. And, and the markets, and everybody's farming was a little bit different. So we, we were adapting the advice we were giving to farmers to fit those systems. And of course, naturally, it was all about the plants. So we were talking about grasses and yield and response to nitrogen fertilizer, but also about using legumes for protein content and how, whether we could marry that together with the high yielding grasses and the protein contents. Uh, and the drought resistance and those things. And I, and I remember so clearly the farmers that I would speak to who would be sh telling me firsthand about resi resilience in their farming system. So for example, the, the dry land farms would be talking about deep rooting plants. The plants that we're now seeing... Actually, Sandpoint, isn't it? Yeah, you know, chicory and oh. coxford and things. But in those days, no one was growing them. Everyone no. was growing ryegrass. And it was monoculture dominant one single species. So now, hearing you talk, I realise how you were able to produce these fantastic Cotswold seed catalogues because, of course, you knew all these farmers because you were selling them seeds. So you knew where to go to get their stories. Yeah, I, I, that's right. I, I, think, you know, the, I mean, I'm a reflection, or the business, this Cotswold seed business, is a reflection of the people that buy seeds from it because, you know, you, you're a good example. I, you know, and I know it would perhaps just talk about your farming because I don't know how you do that on top of everything else you do. But I think for me, what's important is that you've got this um, wealth of knowledge and historically, there is so much information that I've drawn from, which I now uh, have learned to you know, deploy in, in situations for our times. Yeah. So for example, um, uh, one farmer I spoke to very recently in um, North Wales, he contacted me. He's a, he's a, he's a very intelligent, uh, relatively you know, good sized dairy farm uh, and is moving with the times. And 20 years ago, he contacted me and we spoke about deep rooting uh, lays, sort of purple lays, if you like, that type of thing, multi-species and swords, with grasses and legumes, deep rooting clovers and so on, and with, uh, with herbs. And he, like me, has read the Clifton Park farming system, and so he's got the history and he's spoken to other people. He's traveled the world speaking to all sorts of people about how they're managing their forage plants in order to produce this most amazing dairy that he's just produced. And he wrote to me, uh, you know, we've exchanged emails just very, very recently, and I was 
really flattered that he remembered back our, our conversation 20 years ago. But that's so typical of the world I've been in, you know, where things are changing, but there is this, you know, we're grounded by the soil, by the plants that we grow on it, by the farming systems, and we're governed really largely by weather, by, you know, uh, uh, the, the factors around us that we can't change. So we're, we're you know, we're, I mean, in the sea trade, we are so lucky because we, our, our product is, um, I suppose, I mean, it's a bit like yours in a way, it's sort of information, it's it getting information over that bridge to people. And the seeds are almost secondary. It's, 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 it's the farming system that we're working within, within the seed business, especially when you're talking about perennial plants, unlike the annual plants, um, like well, maize or wheat or whatever. Were you selling the Clifton Park mixture? When was Cotswold Seeds founded? 1974. Yeah, so in 78, the yeah. first reseed we ever did think it was, was a Clifton Park That's right. play that might have been purchased yeah, yeah. from absolutely. Cotswold Seeds. Well, I, I think it was, and I think, you know, we are, I mean, I, absolutely, and there was, but there was only a handful of you doing it, that yeah. is what you may not know. So yeah. there were a few people who, um, Barry Wookie and others who... Barry had, Wookie, yes, yeah. I, I knew Barry. And, and you know, these, these people had, had, um, had never given it up, actually. They had always been growing these plants, but there were others who were joining them, and I could never have made a business out of supplying those seeds. In fact, it was really difficult to get the seeds in the first place. Yeah. But I could never have made a business because it was a minority of, of farmers. So you were selling a sort of mixture of mainstream yeah. seeds and yeah. a bit on the side, as yes, it were, but of the Robin kind of stuff. Hill, my mentor uh, and predecessor, if you like, uh, Robin died uh, uh, back in 2017. But he was a believer in legumes. So he was, the, in my mind, the person that influenced me mostly around using forage legumes for not only animal nutrition uh, and resilience in the soil, but also to, um, to rebuild soils and farm in a way that didn't need the synthetic products. So you, through your catalogue, it's almost as if it's a, a story in its own right, the, the catalogue that you've published, I don't know how many years you've done it for, a lot of years. Yeah, 50 years. Each year you look at farmer... Uh, champions of particular yes. systems and it's it's a, it's the story of the development of Cotswold seeds really isn't it so yeah. tell us give us a a sort of overview of how big the business is and what it what the number of hectares or how, I don't know how what stats you've got but yeah, how yeah. can you chart the progress that this what seems to me be it's now emergent almost grass revolution of thinking that there has been about herbal lays and about really doing, putting into practice all those principles which were so tiny in terms of how many people were actually doing that back in the 70s. Yeah, they, well, that's right. Well, it, the thing, it, it grew very gradually. I mean, honestly, for the first 20 years, um, I remember until the turn of the century, so we'd been going for 25 years, roughly at that point, we never made any money. I mean, we were, we were hand to mouth and we were running on fumes with the yes. description. Yes. Some years we lost a few thousand, yes. some years we made a few thousand. But what was happening, I noticed, was that the number of farmers that were coming to us was increasing very gradually. Yes. And we, uh, Robin always told me, you know, you must think long term. You're in a long term business. And, Absolutely. you know, yeah, absolutely, because, I, you, know, gone, you know, it wasn't about this, the instant gratification of a sale today. It was about whether you might be, uh, you know, dealing with farms generationally. And because then, you know, the conversation is very different and you're thinking, you know, you're genuinely giving the, 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 what you think is the correct advice to people for their long term and your long term benefit as part of the you know, supply chain to that, to that or supplier to that farmer. So anyway, in the early days, we had it when when I joined, there was a few hundred customers, uh, mostly in uh, in Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire, Warwickshire, and um, what about today then? Well, today we're about twenty thousand farmers. Uh, twenty thousand. I know it's astonishing, that's isn't it? Amazing. Well, yeah, yeah. That's quite a significant percentage <coughs> well, of farmers. Farm yeah, it's, I, I mean, I don't know. I, it's really difficult to get the exact numbers. We used to have records that the Ministry of Agriculture kept back in the day when they existed. Uh, before DEFRA, but they used to tell, we had all the stats and figures in terms of seeds that were sold so we could benchmark where we were. That stopped in 1999. So now as a very rough guess, we might be supplying in, you know, in the UK, I don't know, 10 or 15% of the farmers with their seeds. I mean, I've, I actually don't know the number. Exactly. I know how many customers we have. Yes, but that's, but, I mean, that's but a bull It's a lot of people. That's a lot. Oh, it's, we're, so, we're so fortunate. I can't tell you how setting up as Robin did, how that has paid off and the long-term nature of that business. Like for any farming, 
you know, you have to think about rotations and longevity. No, I, I'm not going to push you, but I mean, do you want to say any more how many people you employ, what your turnover so is, that kind of thing? So, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, we started with three of us. Um, and uh, we're now, I, I mean, we're about 25 people in the seed business. Um, and with FarmEd as well, we're about 25 there, roughly, well, I think it's 23 at the moment. Um, so I feel, and that's nice, and it's as you say, you know, with the sustainable food trust, there is a point at which you don't necessarily want to get any bigger. And it's not that I'm not ambitious, but I really enjoy the quality of what we do. But, you know, again, I don't want to push you, you don't want to divulge this, but as I understand it, Cotswold sees has become financially successful, but you decided, because it was your decision, that you wanted to put the profits into a, an educational project. Yes, so what happened was about 15 years ago, um, we had, well in fact 20 years ago we had a trials ground right next to where the seed business and the warehouse and everything is, and um, we were getting people coming to look at these deep rooting plants and um, you know, and, and methods of establishment and things like that on five acres. And we, we had a flow of people coming in. Anyway, we realised that people were interested, but we also realised, and Robin was always very good at spotting it, that there were changes coming. So when things like, you know, when the numbers of organic farmers increased, for example, when set-aside came, when the environmental schemes came into existence, Cotswold Seeds was always very good at identifying that change. Mm. So the thing you need at that moment is information and knowledge and you know decisions on farming businesses that are sound so we decided that we were getting so much intelligence from agriculture through the farmers that we were speaking to that it would be a really good idea to demonstrate that especially not just to farmers but to people that were perhaps on the fringes of farming, so the food industry, the regulators, who weren't necessarily on a farm every day, but might want to be discussing how in practice you might sequester carbon or how you might uh, increase um, you know, farmland birds or the, the, the problems, the barriers to change. What happens if you fragment a food system on the farm? If you have a more diverse farm, how do you sell your food? Where do you store the grains? You know, these practical issues we wanted to show. So what did you do? So, to... well, Celine, my wife, decided uh, for us, um, she, she was adamant that you just had to get some land, enough land to demonstrate not only where we were at in terms of, like, you know, this is what we're currently doing, like a control, but also, more importantly, some of the things we might do in the future. So we needed to be big enough, but not too big. Not too big because we had no money, really. I mean, we, we, yes, the business had accumulated a few hundred thousand pounds, actually, but um, we weren't big enough to go and buy a no. estate. You know, so we, we had 100 acres come up on the market quite close to us, and we decided that we would go for it, as it were. And, and when I'm, you say go for it, you didn't set up a charity? You no. Know. So what we did was we had enough money for a deposit to buy a small farm, which we were successful in buying at auction, with, in the room with 100 oh, okay. other good friends who were also very curious to see what was going on in the local area. So farmers and neighbours. And when the hammer fell, honestly, I, 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 felt really, I felt really ill because I'd taken a mortgage on. And I hadn't had a mortgage before. Uh, nothing like that, anyway, for a, you know, I'd had a house mortgage. But the, so the farm became a reality through a, a mortgage that we had taken um, uh, 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 from an agricultural bank, which enabled us to have land to demonstrate on. So it was 107 acres uh, in West Oxfordshire. And that's now become farm ed. But at the time, we devised a plan that would show uh, crop rotations, would show agroforestry, would show um, shelter belts, would show natural flood management, orchards for fruit, vegetable production, with a CSA on five acres of a market garden. We'd reintroduce livestock into this farm. Because this farm had been monoculture arable, continuous cereals for decades. So it was a perfect blank canvas. So we kept a bit of that to show people that. And we still farm that in the same way that we uh, that has always been done with uh, you know with with seven or eight passes of the tractor after the seed is sown. So that would be weed control, that would be fertilisers and so on. And the rest of the farm we're farming. We've sort of gone cold turkey, and we're farming it for carbon sequestration, for uh, natural uh, uh, nature improvements, of course, and also to reintroduce people onto the farm. And I think currently, we, although the, the farm ed staff today is 20-something is people, 
there are uh, in total on the farm now about 35 people who are working either at Farm Ed or on the farm running their own business. Does the business of Farm Ed stroke the farm? wipe its face, does it cover its costs? It's going to, but right now, my priority is demonstration. Yeah. So my number one priority is not to make a profit on the farm. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's to demonstrate yes. a well, farming systems. Well, as we spoke before this conversation, I think we both agree that there was a massive need to create educational stages, and this actually came up in the, the session I was in earlier, uh, where be, what we're calling Beacon Farms become uh, knowledge distributors, yeah. because the best people to learn from, if you want to learn a new practice, is from a farmer. Peer-to-peer learning is absolutely critical, and you know I, I, the, that's the approach we take on on the farm. And I know you do, and I and I know plenty of other amazing farms that are doing the same thing. Exactly. And I think this is really important. And of course, they're all different. So our conversations are always around knowledge sharing, about talking to each other about what we're doing, bringing people in. Perhaps if it's around carbon credits, or if it's around um, supermarket supply chains. We, we bring as many people together for a very open conversation to try and understand uh, how we can make changes for the benefit of all of us. Because otherwise, it's, um, you know, it's no good just, just having uh, you know, people with one brilliant idea. You need everybody in that conversation to really, as you know, with your work that you're doing to make change. So for us, it's about bringing farmers in uh, who are real farmers, real conversations, to a place where we can talk about farming very easily. Um, we've got a really small farm, and our demonstrations are really small. It's one of the reasons it may not make cash. And I think it's wonderful that it is small, because I, yeah. I think I believe that my, microcosm, macrocosm, you know, if you get the small right, then the big will... will, will yeah. Will, well, everyone talks mirroring. about, you know, these global, you know, problems and, um, you know, mass migration and, and the parts per million of, of carbon in the atmosphere, etc. And as, a, as a, an individual human being, that's really difficult to understand. Exactly. But on the ground, you get it. Well, exactly. You know? And I always think that, you know, if the, the global food system is akin to a giant organism, the farm is the cell. And let's start with making the cells healthy. And your farm ed farm is aspiring and becoming a healthy cell and spreading wonderfully. Well, it's amazing how, how, how it ripples, isn't it? I mean, it is astonishing. I mean, we started with um, farmers coming to the farm uh, 10 or 11, whenever it was when we started, 10 or 11 years ago now. And um, farmers were coming down the drive and we might take 30 farmers around and, um, you know, we'd have a really good few hours. We had no toilets, no, no car no. park, you know, no, no facilities to feed anybody, but people were still coming. Anyway, as the years have gone on, we've, we've, um, we've realised that um, a lot of people are interested in that conversation. So now we have 25,000 people a year come, uh, which is, I find, absolutely astonishing. Uh, I, I have to sometimes, when I watch, you know, we have a new drive now, we've yes. got water to the farm, we've got toilets, we've got a car park, and we've got the most amazing buildings. I mean, they you are, certainly have. <laughs> they, they are. I recommend, you're really listening to this, who haven't yet been to Farm Ed, you should go there. We, we've held a couple of events at your place. It's been wonderful. Well, for anyone thinking about demonstration farms, you know, and I believe strongly that they are key to a transition. And so a we transition. do too. And as you rightly say, there are, there are amazing projects going on already all over the country. And they're very diverse. Because, and that's appropriate because farm scales and systems are diverse. But what we do think is that there should be some sort of mycelial link between them all so that we feel part of a network of uh, farms acting as platforms for education. Totally agree. Other totally farmers, agree. but also children. Absolutely. And so our Beacon Farms project, we're not, we don't want to eclipse or challenge anything that's already going on, but we, we would like to be a sort of glue that also creates models which could be templates. And specifically, I think that in a way, the education process you've been describing is a storytelling exercise, and farmers have got to become good storytellers, and we want to help with that. Mm. We want to help make sure that we direct people who need to have a, a transition inspiration to farms which are able to do a good job of that and hopefully make uh, them make financial sense of it as well. Yes, and there are, I think the really exciting news is that there are a lot of people on this journey at different stages. I mean, we've had people ahead of us and we've, we're, we're where we are and there are people behind us, as it were, on the timeline. And I'm literally speaking to people in, on all continents about developing things like, well, let's call them beacon farms, uh, where people can go and, uh, you know, peer-to-peer learning happens uh, in, on, on real farmland. 
And I think that that's incredibly powerful. And in small, in our, all of our own small ways, joining us all up, we are quite a force to be reckoned with. We and are. it gives confidence to everybody. And why make the same mistakes again? If, you know, if we share our information, and this is going back to what we were talking about earlier on, I'm very competitive as a person. I'm sure you are. But actually, right now, what's required for these beacon farms is sharing. We ha- you're so right, and I think that's the spirit of the time. Everybody's got an ego, and I remember once the prince, as he then was actually, at a, on this American aforementioned visit, he sat down with a group of uh, faith leaders, and he said, you know, the biggest struggle in life is the struggle with the ego. And I think particularly for men, it's, yes. a, it's a, you know, you want to be successful in a business or even on a farm or in an NGO. Yes. And actually, it's, it's time now. We have to work in the commons. So the spirit of trust that, you know, you're speaking about now, I think is really, really important. So let's, mm-hmm. let us collaborate over the coming months. But before we stop, I want to ask you one question, which is back into the discussion we had yesterday, which is that in Cotswold Seeds, you're supplying amazing seeds. We buy them and they transform our farming system. But there's also another issue, isn't there, which Rudolf Steiner mentioned in his, it's the centenary of his agriculture lectures this year. He gave them in June 1924, so we're 100 years. One of the things he said in his agriculture lectures was farmers should breed from the plants and animals on their holding uh, because they would become what we now call epigenetically adapted to the unique ecosystem which every farm represents. Now, we are a long way from that. I mean, there's a sort of embryonic seed-saving movement in the vegetable world, and the Victorians did a lot of that. We lost that. And, of course, now we've got regulations which make that almost impossible. And your Cotswold seed history doesn't yet do that. But have you got anything to say about that? Because I think it's, you know, we don't need to beat ourselves up from where we are, about where we are, do we? But we, it would be interesting to reflect 100 years on from what Rudolf Steiner said as to whether we see that as being becoming more possible in the future. Yes, I, I, for me, this question goes back to the use of species. Um, and actually, in, t- in reality, we're using only a handful of species, whether that's our animals or our plants. Um, for me, I, I suppose my, my real interest is in the plants because it's the area I know and, and work in. We use so few species. I mean, you know, the, the figures are quite shocking. Literally three to four plants contribute 50% of the food we eat. Yeah. You know, rice, wheat, yeah. um, corn, uh, you know, in, uh, maize as we call it. But these, these plants are very large areas, uh, commodity produced, uh, and probably at the heart of our own health, uh, at least, you know, the deterioration on our our own health. So for me, it goes back to the using one more species, because there are hundreds of plant species that we can use, not only for um, us, but also for the animals that we feed. But that's, if you don't mind me saying so, that's, I totally buy into that. That's about diversity. And the herbal lays that we buy from you are bringing in plants that should be part of what our cows eat in an amazing diverse mix but there is another additional thing isn't it? which is that yes. whether those same plants yes. and the seeds that you sell me in the future might become more to use a sheep word hefted yes to, well you know what i mean yes i do know what you mean and this goes right back to i think the seeds act in 1965 roughly uh-huh. I mean, back to history but look, the, the reason that CDAC came in was because there was a lot of unscrupulous trading, there was no regulation for the production of seeds, and so it was decided in those days by the Minister of Ag to formalise the way in which seeds were produced. And that has led to the intellectual property of those seeds now being held in the hands of very few people. So, um, not unsurprisingly, if there's only a few crops and there's not much diversity in those crops in terms of what you and I sow on the farms, uh, we're sort of in trouble from a genetic base point of view. What I think is really interesting is that there are a number of farms, I mean, yes, one, we're putting to get where we can, especially with things like herbal we can put in 25 species, uh, and that's very doable. With a monoculture wheat, for example, where we're growing a single species of wheat, we have tended, even on organic farms, to use a single variety. Oh, definitely. 
And the question now is, you know, can we get more resilience into our farming system, more diversity, better health of plants, better gut health for us, by having a population of plants, something that's moving the whole time as opposed to being very static. And the, the, on the one hand, we've got complete control of our seeds by having this, the seed act and control of plant varieties and breeding in particular ways. On the other hand, it's jolly expensive. It's very... Uh, it, it's owned by only a few people yeah. and it doesn't necessarily uh, help us with innovation into new food areas. No. And if I can give an analogy, in AI, artificial insemination, when it came in in the 30s into the UK, it was heralded as a wonderful way of increasing genetic diversity so that you could buy semen from a dairy bull that was amazing. Of course, the opposites happened. So in a way... The big seed companies that own all the seeds, including, I don't know what, how, what the control is in the grass seed industry, but basically it's narrowed the genetic diversity which used to be in farming. And I'm just wondering whether you can see a root map for Cotswold seeds, which starts not just in the herbal lay thing, which I get, but in linking the where the seeds come from. It's like the story behind the seed, if you know what I mean. Yes, it is, it is. And um, so if you take, um, so we're already involved with looking at some wheats, for example, which is a population of wheats, and there's a lot of, yeah. a lot of farms yeah. growing these populations. We have one at Farm Meadows of Demonstration. And that's really interesting because the population moves, it shifts through the yeah. epigenetics that, yes. you, that you're talking about. And I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of uh, conflicted by it slightly because on the one hand, I like uniformity and people like exactly. to buy uniformity. Exactly. And that's not, I don't mean that in the field necessarily, but no, you know, I, if you're I selling seeds to a farmer, yeah. they, they, want to, they want to know the pedigree of it and that it's t t stable. What, you, what, what, the, what, your, what we're talking about with epigenetics is a moving population exactly. that, is, that is well suited to the farm. And the thing about plants, unlike animals, you can actually breed quite a lot of plants quite quickly. And so you can, if you take an annual wheat, for example, you can have a generation every year, and the movement in the genes, the genes that turn on and off through epigenetics, happens relatively which fast. Is, which is fascinating. It is fascinating, and um, uncon to some degree uncontrollable. But if you think of a natural production system, you've got this evolution of plants that are moving to your site, to your soil type, to your topography, you know, to your um, own system of farming. And I think that's very exciting, actually. So in answer to your question, I'm bound, really, by the seed regulations within the field of work that I'm in at Cotswold wow. Seeds. So that's really, there's a, there's a, that represents a barrier to it's you. It's absolutely a barrier, because Good there God. are very few ways of, of changing that method of production to something that is un regulated and allowed to move with the natural world. So that's the space we're in at the moment. And yes, we're, a lot of us talking about it. And the wheat example is a really good one, where with, um, with YQ populations, for example, and others who have been developing their own populations, we're beginning to see a, a, a on-farm breeding program, if you like, run by farmers, which I find very exciting. Now, we've been doing this with Sanfoin as one example for a long time, because Sanfoin uh, has a um, uh, scope to, for it not to be certified to a particular variety. So we're able to use epigenetics and to use land races and to use things that fit regions. So yes, well, we're, we're on that. I, I think uh, it's got to the point now where we've been talking quite a while and the prayer, really? the, the prayer room uh, is calling us to be occupied for <laughs> prayer. So I think this would be quite a, a right moment to conclude this discussion. But... It's interesting to reflect that yesterday we were with the minister talking about the unlocking of some of these barriers which are preventing heritage varieties and epigenetic uh, availability or seeds that can become involved in this new development uh, becoming more possible. So what a, it's a moment of um, transition, isn't it, on many, many levels. And it is, Patrick, yeah. And so, it's been wonderful to go back over the, well, 50 years. Well, we're both still enthusiastic. And uh, in the world that we're living in, we've adapted. And I suspect we're going to have to do quite a bit more of that. Yes, well, let's, uh, let's build on this conversation. And it's been wonderful uh, having mm. it with you, Ian. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day, Patrick. Nice to see you. Thank you.